915 as we welcome in our co-hosts on this Friday morning. Delegate Michael Height, the Badger. Good morning, Michael. Here. Great to have you with us, man. Thank Even you, with sir. your microphone down, it was still nice to have you. <laughs> yeah. Here. Now it's up. Also, Mr. David Valente is hey. in the house. David, good, good to see you. Good morning. In the Bill Stubblefield seat. Yes, sir. There was some debate earlier this week as to whether you were an ideal candidate to substitute for Mr. Stubblefield. And I said, I, I think he's a very good person to substitute for Mr. Stubblefield. He's, he's modern. He's well-reasoned. He's thoughtful. And uh, Who are you talking about? <laughs> um, Mr. <laughs> Mr. David Valente, I, I think I know that guy. Don't, yeah, you don't think you don't think you fit that description? Yeah, sure. Yeah, or, or not? Maybe I was wrong. <laughs> maybe everybody else is right, and I am wrong. Anyway, welcome to the show. Thank you. Our uh, eight thirty-five segment. We'll have our Friday Five. Brad Noel will make his debut on the Friday Five this week in the Larry Schultz chair. Mr. Joseph Joey Torts Ferretti will join us via phone, and Mike Carl is back as well. Until then, however, in our first segment, we welcome in the House Majority Leader, Delegate Eric Householder. Good morning, E. How are you? Good morning, Rob. Boy, you got the A team in there today. Oh, I'm telling you, we're hitting big time, baby. <laughs> we're so going good morning, out. Good morning, gentlemen. How good you morning. Guys doing? morning. Valente's juiced up on some Mountain Dew, yeah, man. too. Is that, that's oh, not diet, ready. is it? It is diet. It is dough, so you don't really have the sugar. All right. <laughs> no, I'm not. Yeah, I can't do that. So. Top, totally not. All right. Well, Eric, the revenue numbers for the month of August, the subject matter for our discussion here this morning and are we experiencing a disturbing trend of missing the projections every month there no no i don't think so and keep in mind sometimes i've heard on this station and other stations some of your listeners and others would say hey we'd like to see these revenue numbers a lot closer we hate to see these wild swings of all this big surpluses well you're getting a chance to experience that i mean for the month of july we were five million positive this month, we're a little softer. We're $5 million to the negative. I mean, for the year, we're only off about $205,000. And a lot of that could be contributed to a timing issue. The last day of the month was on a Saturday. So uh, corporate net income tax returns. You've got uh, severance taxes. We could have easily, easily been, uh, you know, $5 million plus uh, positive. So, no, I mean, I, I think we're – we're staying the course now. It's going to blow my little projection that I did back in July for you guys when I said we we would seek about a five hundred thirty six million dollars surplus. Mm -hmm. In order to reach that, we need to see about forty nine million dollars every month. So I don't know if we're going to meet my projection or not, but uh, but for the month of August, the state had estimated that we would bring in about four hundred and eight million dollars in revenue. We only brought in four hundred and three million, and of course I'm rounding these numbers. So we we missed our mark by about five million dollars. But personal income tax, we estimated 155 million, and our actual collections were 151 million. So we were about four million off. Our consumer sales tax, we estimated 162 million, but we brought in 166 million. So we're four million to the positive. Severance tax, we estimated 38 million. We only brought in 25 million, 12 million dollar difference in our corporate net income tax. We estimated 3.8 million, and we only brought in well, we brought in 4.8, so we we were positive 1 million. So overall, little soft, about 5 million 152 thousand 482 dollars is where we missed our estimates. But keep in mind, our rainy day fund has uh, 1.2 billion in it. Our income tax reserve fund has 447 million in it. So we've got sitting on the sidelines, you know like $1.6 billion for any fiscal calamity that may happen. So I think we're still in good shape. Delegate Michael Height, you sit on the Finance Committee. Do you have any concerns? No, no, not at all. Um, <laughs> you just be nice. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I Really, I don't. Um, we, we see some fluctuations from time to time, from month to month in, in the revenue. Um, you know, a lot of this, you see severance up and down all the time, and you notice this month that severance is down, I think Eric said uh, $12, million. $12 million. So, yeah. you know, you're going to have fluctuations like that in severance, and, and that will play a big part in it. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not worried – um, throughout the the whole year, the, I, I think the uh, the the economy in West Virginia is still strong, um, so I, I think revenues will be fine. Mr. Valente, yeah. Uh, so as you are uh, beginning to transition out of the legislature, right. what are your thoughts about 
the future, especially, you know, with, with Governor Justice hemming and hawing about uh, calling a special session about, you know, dropping the tax rates and things like that. What are, you, what are your thoughts about the future of West Virginia's revenues and, and how that will impact? Right. Well, I'm excited for two reasons. Number one, I think that we have an opportunity to elect a, a good conservative governor, Patrick Morrissey, and, um, you know, most of us sitting here at this table or, or talking to you on the phone today, we, we know the experience that, that Patrick Morrissey has. And I think the, the key to this is to stay the course, to keep those budgets flat. Uh, if you want to, if you're a strong believer in smaller, limited government, we're going to have to tighten up our belt a little bit more so we can reward money back to our cons- uh, back to our constituents. I mean, the whole idea of this tax cut is to, at some point, to further eliminate the personal income tax. And if that's the priorities of the state and of our uh, House and Senate, then we're going to have to tighten the belt and we're going to have to stay the course. And uh, it can be done, but you can't do it if you're going to continue. You know, spending uh, extravaganzas uh, left and right. I'm, I know a lot of these programs always sound good, but think about this. I mean, our budget, 50, 50, uh, approximately 57% of our budget goes to two sources, education and human services. So, you know, we have to decide, and I've said this before, what are the priorities of the state? Is it going to be education? Are we going to continue the welfare state? What are the priorities? And, um, uh, you know, as I look to the future, that's what I'm hoping that uh, a governor like Patrick Morrissey will will rein in some of the spending, will continue to uh, deliver tax relief, because I think that's what our citizens are looking for. When you talk about reining in spending, though, you have to yeah. sort of pick and choose where you're reining it in. Where where are we overspending? Where are we underspending? Um, whether it's in education or human services or, or right. somewhere else in the government. Um, and I think sort of that's what uh, the flatline budget has exposed to a degree, um, right. but it's also exposed some some areas we do need to put more money, um, and 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 some areas we still need to cut. So I think, you know, that's what the the legislature is trying to do right now is find out those those areas that need more money and those areas that need more cut. Um, so you know there there could be some growth or or we could see some some uh, cuts as well i i don't know which way it's going to go but um you know i think the the flatline budget has uh has exposed a lot in the budget and uh has has been good for us absolutely i mean you've been down there long enough now that uh you know you've heard this word privatization you know we we've tried for several years to sell some of our state hospitals we already know it's a drain on our budget of upwards of a hundred million dollars uh, there's other things that we have spent money on that, you know, uh, is is roads our priority? I mean, do we want good roads in West Virginia? Or uh, do we want to spend more money for higher education? I mean, think about this. The, the total, you know, the property taxes and real estate taxes that we collect in West Virginia, that's what funds our education. So, you know, we collect around $1.8 to $2 billion uh, every year through those two uh, revenue sources. So, but by the same token, we have on the on the flip side of this, we have a uh, aging population. We do a lot for the IDD waiver, the age and disabled waiver, foster care, you know, and, and that's about thirty five percent of our budget right there with human services. So, you know, there are some trends here that we've got to sit down as a legislature and decide: Do you continue pay raises? I mean, I, me personally, I think if you're going to go down the path of trying to eliminate the personal income tax. You may have to stop, pull the brakes a little bit, and not do any more pay raises in order so you could continue to do, you know, uh, any type of personal income tax cuts. You know, you bring up a, up a couple good uh, areas. The, you talk about first the hospitals, the state hospitals, and I think yes. we have have six. And of those six, uh, four of them are, are long-term nursing yes. facilities. Um, and being on health, I've had the opportunity to visit a few of those. And, and Jackie Withrow, in particular, down in Beckley, um, is uh, the, in the budget about a $50 million uh, a year nut, and it, it houses 50 individuals. Right. Well, that is just wasteful spending. This, this is 
a building that's somewhere in the neighborhood of 100 years old. It is the deferred maintenance on it is is unbelievable. It costs a ton of money to operate this facility. Um, and when you look at the the return on that investment with only 50 individuals staying there, it's it's ludicrous that we are in the the, the long term care the nursing uh, facility business. That's not, I don't think the job of the state. So we need to take a, a, a good look at those areas. However, I think I, I may disagree with you on the, on the waiver side. I think the waiver side is, is drastically underfunded right now in certain areas. Um, and something needs to be done to that, especially when we're yes. getting a, a three to one, uh, fun, funding from the, the federal government as well. Well, I think the common ground that you and I share, share is, Years ago, we should have increased. We should have increased the provider funding instead of increasing the roles to allow more uh, people yes. on it. Yes. And uh, but for whatever reason, the state decided to to you know choose the latter. But uh, I mean, and keep in mind, our, our citizens also dictate the spending habits of the state. I mean, right now you're seeing a big big push for you know childcare, uh, you know some type of tax credits or, or rebates, but all that has a personal cost to it. And, you know, if the citizens aren't being told, hey, look, you're going to be better off by having no state income tax as opposed to all this uh, uh, spending, you know, those are decisions, hard decisions that the legislature is going to have to make. And uh, going forward, you guys are going to have a tough job. A couple of questions for points of clarity here, Eric. And if I miss this along the way, my apologies. But I know when you guys closed out your legislative session, you passed what you called a skinny budget and you were going to deal with other things as the summer unfolded. Has the final budget been addressed yet? I believe so. I mean, the skinny budget, and Mike, you can step in. It was like $4.996 billion. And then we had a special session in May where we passed about another $236 million. So if my math is correct, uh, that's about $5.2 billion budget. And I think the governor's introduced budget was like five point two. So we're, re- re- excuse me, re- relatively close to what the governor's introduced budget is. Is that still to be finalized or is that it? No, I think if that's it. So. Yeah, I would I would agree. I, I think when we had that first special session, that's uh, that's what we went back down to address. Um, I didn't quite agree with uh, how we addressed it on the human services side right. where we just gave them $183 million in sort of like a slush fund. But that, that $183 million was equivalent to what they cut out of different line items and it allowed them to spend it in different areas without having to to move it around as much. Um, I don't know if they've spent that down, but that's sort of what took care of that that uh, that skinny budget was uh, was to get back in there in May and take care right. of it. Right. Of that five point two billion dollar budget, is there a five percent raise included in that five point two billion dollar budget projection? Yes, the legislature passed a five percent uh, pay raise during the regular session. So that raise would kick in when? Or has it already? No, that raise will kick in January, I believe. So as it it stands right now, all state employees, relatively speaking, will get a 5% raise on average? I believe so, yes. Yes. Okay. And does that budget include the trigger mechanism for the state income tax cut of at least 4%? It would not. Because remember, the, the triggers happen sometime in august but um you know you're 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 seeing about an 83 million dollar difference in in the revenue you know from this four percent tax cut so but keep in mind as revenue i've I've mentioned this before you see a natural growth in revenue year to year to year of about 150 million dollars every year so that should be able to cover the four percent tax cut and by the way, for those of you watching on TV 10, we finally got Comcast to unfreeze us. So we're back to <laughs> looking at Eric's smiling face on the TV instead of go. Ernie McCook, who was frozen <laughs> on there <laughs> some, <laughs> some terminally since last night's game with Shepard 123-0, oh, wow. by the way. So Ernie McCook just got bumped off by your face, Eric. Hope you're <laughs> happy. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and, and can I assume correctly that there is nothing in this $5.2 billion budget that addresses child care costs that would be correct okay yeah and that's what i mean these are decisions moving forward that the legislature is going to have to make and sit down and decide i mean 
you know, right now we've heard the governor would like to call us back in uh, for uh, another special session in September. There's been, you know, I haven't heard whether or not that's going to happen. Uh, I know I've heard other radio stations. I heard the speaker on Hoppy yesterday where, you know, they were asked, they was asking the speaker about the tax cuts, and he and the speaker basically said, hey, look, you know, I'm all for more tax cuts, but I'd like to see a plan. And the governor's office hasn't produced any plan yet. So who knows if we'll even be having this special session in September or not. What would, what would a plan be, Mike or, or Eric, other than, hey, let's just lop another 5% off? What, what kind of a detailed plan do you need other than that? Well, I mean, I'll go first, and then we'll defer to Mike. But, I, I mean, I, I would like to see some type of spending cut mechanisms. Keep in mind, I've been harping time and time again, you've got to control the rate of spending if, you're gonna, if you want to do an additional tax cuts. And then if you do want to do additional tax cuts, you have the potential. You have $590 million surplus right now sitting on the sideline. You should take at least 220 to $250 million of that and put it into the income tax reserve fund as another stopgap. That's what I would do. Mike? Yeah, yeah, I think that's part of the problem. I think that you know the House and Senate and the governor's office have been negotiating for some time now, um, and they just can't come to any agreement, which is why we thought – that there wasn't going to be a special session. And I think this sort of came out of left field. I don't think the House and the Senate had any idea that the, the governor was going to make this announcement about calling us back into special session because they haven't been able to reach some kind of consensus. So I, I, I think it is is uh, confusing to the legislature somewhat right now that the governor would make this play Um when we're we're nowhere close to uh, a consensus on what to do, and I, like like Eric said, there doesn't seem to be a plan with how we're going to implement this or why we're implementing this. Yeah, I mean the governor just announced, hey, let's do an additional five percent. Yeah. But keep in mind, I've advocated if we're going to do this, and I think the governor has actually advocated on this on this station. If you're going to do this, you need to pull some of this surplus and park it into the income tax reserve fund. You know, the, the, the stronger and the bigger this stop, uh, this back net is, this backstop, you know, it's going to protect you sometime down the future in case something were to go awry. But uh, does, the leg- does the legislature even have appetite to do that? I have no idea. But uh, remember back when we passed this bill, I had advocated about putting $700 million into this income tax reserve fund, and I allowed the governor to talk me down to about $400 million. But uh, I really wish you would have had a, a nice uh, backstop there of about $700 million, and then that would allow you to accelerate if you do want to accelerate over and above the trigger. And keep in mind with the trigger, some years you may only see 1%. Some years you may see 5 6 or 7%. So, so You know, one of the other interesting things that will come out of this is if we go to special session, are you going to have a, a, Repo- a conservative Republican supermajority vote against a tax cut i mean that would be unheard of if if that were to happen um but that that is a possibility it is very much a possibility because we've we've got to be prudent there's no sense to pass something and then spend the the remainder 590 million dollars on other stuff and, and not have any backstop or or you know any care about what could happen in the future with all the spending that we have done in the last two years did you have a question, yeah. David? So I want to take you back to something you'd said during uh, a little bit earlier about perhaps freezing uh, yeah. employee uh, raises, state employee raises. Right. right. So, I, you know, I think that's something because we have stupidly not gone with locality pay in the state of West Virginia. Um, it's something that's going to be, you know, cutting off our, our nose to, to spite our face because right. we are, you know, if we don't do it here, uh, we are subject to the whims of, you know, Washington County or down right. to Winchester. We we've got money all around us uh, for our state for state employees to be taken away, um, and you know it's a constant struggle. I, I talk about you know how a a freeze on state pay would you know it is. I think that's going to end up hurting us more than than saving the the state of West Virginia. Well, I, I think you're right, David, but when I mentioned a freeze on state pay, I was putting it in the context of, okay, what are their priorities? 
you could do a pay raise, no more than about 5%, but by the same token, you can't do the pay raise, also do PEIA, also do the Student Success Act. You know, all, every one of these other programs and every one of these other great ideas that lawmakers have all have an additional price tag. But that's why the legislature should sit down and say, okay, what are the priorities? And if it is just uh, education, you could do the pay raises, but only the pay raises, and be very mindful of other spending uh, uh, items that's going to cost the state money. I mean, just think about it. When you're the finance chair, you've got a lot of decisions to make because people are coming to you, lawmakers are coming to you, and they're saying, hey, we really need this bill. We need this Katherine Johnson uh, charter school bill. Well, when you look at the fiscal note and you see that it has a $100 million cost, unfortunately, you've got to tell the the, uh, the law mayor, no, we can't run that. You know what I mean? So every one of these uh, great ideas always have some type of cost associated with it. And if the legislature would button down and say, okay, let's, let's focus on pay raises, because obviously we need it up here in our area with the uh, – with Washington County to our north and Loudoun County to our east. Um, but those are decisions that the legislature is going to have to make. I mean, I've tried. I've tried to keep us focused when I was finance chair, uh, but it's very tough. You know, I, I think, you know, when Eric says you know, looking at employee raises, uh, I think he's probably talking across the board and, and not sure. necessarily a locality teachers, pay yeah. bill. Yeah. There, there will be a locality pay bill. Eventually. In, yeah. in, well, it, it's coming this session. There will be one on the Senate side and the House side this coming yeah. session. So we'll see if we're, we're poised to get it across the, the finish line this year or not. I would hope so. It was eight votes shy in the House, and but the Senate had, uh, through uh, Jason Barrett, had put something through last time, mm -hmm. at least a resolution to look into it, and then that got shot down. Do I yeah. have that correct? Yes, that is correct. Eric, I have it's, about a minute it's, left it's, here. Yeah. Well, I mean, locality pay is an issue that I've been advocating and others for the last 14 years. We've just never been able to get it over the finish line because the politics at state government, everything's regional. And, uh, I mean, remember, I brought down a $10 million pay raise just for state troopers, excuse me, $380,000 pay raise just for state troopers in the eastern panhandle, and it ballooned up to uh, a, a pay raise for across the state costing $30 million. So those are the problems that you have when you bring bills like that to the floor when it's just dealing with locality pay. So hopefully – it won't uh, balloon and get out of uh, control like the last one. Real quick, Eric, you mentioned the $400 million set aside. What is the status of that money at this time? Yeah, right now it's grown to $447 million, so it's it's incurring interest, and uh, but it's in the income tax reserve fund. So like I said, we have $1.6 billion sitting on the sidelines if there, if there are any fiscal calamity. Uh, Eric, thank you very much for your time. Are you HVAC in it this morning? No, no, I'm staring at a screen, estimating, so burning out my retinas. <laughs> well, this is the first time I think I've talked to you when you haven't been ripping somebody's HVAC yeah. out or putting somebody's in. Exactly. Uh, pays All to right, be a blue-collar man. Hey, thanks, Eric. Appreciate your time this morning. See you all.